So good morning, everyone. Today we are going to be wrapping up our discussion on convection heat transfer and jumping into a lecture on heat exchangers. So without further ado, I'll kick it over to our notes and we'll start the discussion. So just as a, a wrap up from convective heat transfer, convection. It stated that convection follows Newton's law of cooling, where Q is equal to our H or heat transfer coefficient times our surface area times the temperature gradient of our system, which we describe as Ts minus T infinity. Now, when it comes to these type of problems, a lot of times we're concerned with finding our heat transfer coefficient. And so to identify our heat transfer coefficient, we must determine our Neusselt number. Our Neusselt number is equal to HLC over K or H times D over K for flow through pipes. And to find Neusselt number, we typically rely on Reynolds and a Prandtl number. to find new salt. Where we have to first calculate our Reynolds number and then consider if the flow is laminar or turbulent. If the flow is laminar, we have to consider if entrance effects are significant. where the entrance length is governed as 0.05 times Reynolds times our Prandtl number times our diameter. And if the entrance lengths are significant, we can find new salt from one of two expressions, either 3.66 plus 0 0.065 diameter over length, Reynold, Prandtl, one plus 0 0.04, Reynolds, Prandtl to the two thirds. And this is for circular pipes. And for parallel plates, the initial number follows a similar form, just the constants change. Dr. Lopez? Yes. Remind me, how did we define an entrance length as being significant? Um, if I would say if it's like twenty percent of the total length, got it. Thank you. And then I would you would just break up the problem, doing calculations on the entrance region and then doing calculations on the, the remainder. 
So if they're significant, you can do these sort of calculations. If they're insignificant, we say Newsel is just equal to 3.66. when for systems where t sub s is constant or new salt is equal to 4.36 for systems where lowercase q or heat flux is constant. And that's all for laminar flow. So you have to do these considerations for fully go for it so on number five on the homework since the pipe was submerged in the lake i assumed that the surface temperature was constant but what is another method to understand that the heat flux is constant like if you have a flame that's never ending that'd be an example You could probably approximate something to that extent, right? If, if your temperature gradient or the temperature input is sufficiently high that even though your fluid temperature is changing, the gradient really isn't changing significantly, those are cases that you can argue that the heat flux can be approximated as being constant. So if, if your flame is hot enough, then yes, that would be a good case of that. All right. So for fully developed turbulent flow, we consider nine times out of 10, the entrance length is gonna be insignificant because the entrance length is just 10 times the diameter. And so if it's insignificant, we follow the, what we know as the Colburn equation for flow through a pipe which states our new salt number is equal to 0 0.023 times Reynolds to the 0 0.8 times Brandle to the N, where N is 0.4 for heating, 0.3 for cooling, and 0.33 if you're unsure. A lot of times you'll see it with just 0.33 because people don't want to take the time to actually make the judgment call. So any questions over that? I knew I kind of blew through it, but it was just kind of review from last time. And it also serves as a really nice, neat area to see kind of the highlights of that section. Did you say the, the Colburn equation is very significant or insignificant? Or both? In, okay. Insignificant. Okay. So if, yeah. So let's look at one last problem before we move into heat exchangers, which is this example, example three, which states water is to be heated from 15 to 65 degrees as it flows through a three centimeter diameter, five meter long tube. If the tube is equipped with an electrical resistance heater, which provides uniform heating throughout, such that Q is can be considered constant or heat flux, and basically determine the power rating of the heater and estimate the surface temperature of the tube at the outlet if the system provides hot water at a rate of approximately 10 liters per minute. So not unlike your synthesis assignment due today. So definitely a worthwhile problem to look at. So for this problem, the inlet temperature is 15 degrees C. The exit temperature is 65 degrees C. 
the diameter of the tube is three centimeters or 0.03 meters. The length is five meters. The desired flow rate is 10 liters per minute. And we can consider our heat flux to be constant. Now some other properties we may need, the density of water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, the heat capacity of water, 4,184 joules per kilogram Kelvin, and the kinematic viscosity is approximately 6.58 times 10 to the minus seven meters squared per second, and the Prandtl number for water, approximately 4.32. So I can determine the duty for this heater simply based off of the desired out inlet and outlet temperatures of the water. From thermo, Q is equal to M dot CP delta T. And so I need to find my mass flow rate because I have my heat capacity and my temperature rise. So my mass flow rate is simply the density of water, a thousand kilograms per cubic meter times the volumetric flow rate of 10 liters per minute. I have to convert the minutes to seconds. So one minute is 60 seconds. And I have a thousand liters and one cubic meter. This gives me a mass flow rate of approximately 0 0.167 kilograms per second. Go ahead and double check that just to be sure. Yes. All right, so now I can solve for my duty. 0 0.167 kilograms per second times 4,184 joules per kilogram Kelvin times my delta T of 15 minus 65, which is simply 50 degrees Celsius. So we do this, we get approximately 34.9 kilowatts. Now I need to solve for my heat flux because I know my heat flux is constant. So my heat flux is simply my heat transfer rate divided by the surface area. So I must next determine the surface area of my resistance heater. Well, that's simply pi times the diameter times the length or pi times 0.03 meters times five meters, which gives me a value of 0 0.471 meters squared, which means my heat flux is simply Q over A sub S or 34.9 kilowatts divided by 0 0.471 meters squared. And I get approximately 74 kilowatts per meter squared. Everyone following along so far? Can I get a yes, no, sh head shake, thumbs up? Yes. Thank you. Need to make sure people are alive, conscience during lecture. I know this is riveting stuff and you guys can, you know, hardly stay in your seats. So, If I'm looking for the surface temperature and I know my heat flux is constant, I can say my heat flux, which is Q over A, is equal to H times the, the gradient or the surface temperature minus the exit temperature. So what I really need to identify is my heat transfer coefficient. 
And so to find my heat transfer coefficient, I must find my Reynolds number, my Neusselt number, so then I can find H. So in order to find Reynolds number, I have to find my flow velocity, which is my volumetric flow rate over the cross-sectional area of flow, or 10 liters per minute, doing that conversion, make it into cubic meters per second, divided by pi d squared over four, or pi times 0.03 meters squared divided by four. I do this and I get a velocity of my fluid of approximately 0 0.24 meters per second. Now with my velocity, I can then solve for my Reynolds number and say, well, my Reynolds number is going to be rho u d over mu. I don't have mu. I have the kinematic viscosity, so it's u d over v, or 0 0.24 meters per second times my diameter, 0 0.03 meters, divided by 6.58 times 10 to the minus seventh meters squared per second, which gives me a Reynolds number of approximately 10,700. So definitely turbulent which means my entrance length is gonna be 10 times three centimeters or 30 centimeters, which is much less than five meters. So I can consider that entrance region pretty negligible over the entire length of this water heater. Thus, my Neusselt number can be found using the Colburn equation or 0 0.023 times Reynolds to the 0 0.8 times Brandle to the point four, because I'm heating the water, plugging this in, looks like this. And I get a new value. of approximately 69.1. With that new salt value in hand, I can then solve for my heat transfer coefficient knowing new salt is equal to H D over K, or H is equal to new salt times K divided by D. So I have 69.1 times the thermal conductivity. Oh, what did I give that? I did not. K, 0.631 watts per meter Kelvin. So 0.631 watts per meter Kelvin, thanks Google, divided by diameter 0.03 meters. And so for this problem, my heat transfer coefficient is approximately 1,453 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So now that I finally have H, I can solve for my surface temperature by rearranging my Newton's law of cooling and say TS is equal to the exit temperature plus my heat flux divided by my heat transfer coefficient or 65 degrees Celsius plus, what did I have, 74,000 kilowatts or watts per meter squared divided by 1,453 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And I do this and I get about 115 degrees Celsius. Any questions on that problem? Dr. Lopez? Yes. Can you discuss how you knew you needed to use the Colburn equation, please? Sure. So going back to the Reynolds discussion here, 
So we have to consider if the flow is laminar or turbulent. We did our Reynolds calculation and found that it was a turbulent flow, which means all these expressions that we have right now, I'm scrolling, scrolling, and so we get to our fully developed flow. And for fully developed flow, we, we rely on the Colburn equation for confined flow or flow through a pipe. When this entrance region, LH, which is 10 over times D, is insignificant. And so since the flow is laminar, we can rely on the Colburn equation to find our heat transfer coefficient. Does the same 20% uh, rule apply for laminar, laminar flow? I'm sorry, turbulent? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dr. Lopez. Yes. When you found your Q? Yes. I see where you got it from. It was, never mind. Never mind. I'll see it. Any other questions? All good stuff. I don't understand the LH part. And you said it was the Colburn equation is for turbulent, and then you said if it's insignificant, then we can use laminar. No, the Colburn equation is for fully developed turbulent flow. So if it's turbulent and you're looking at confined flow, use the Colburn equation. So from Reynolds number, once we determine our flow, reg our flow regime, we still look at the LH variable for turbulent and laminar? Just for turbulent. If it's turbulent, okay. you ignore all the laminar equations because it's not laminar. You would just look at the Colburn equation. All right. Any other questions? If not, then let's switch gears and begin our discussion of heat exchangers. So there's a lot that we can discuss about heat exchangers, but let's start with a discussion as a class. So I'd ask what types of design considerations or design constraints do we face as engineers when it comes to the selection and specification of a heat exchanger. All right, so Jabria, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had a feeling you were going to call on me, so I was trying to find an answer <laughs> before. Um, I don't know. I don't want to like sound stupid. There's no. 
Yeah. Well, sounds stupid. <laughs> um. You can always maybe. just say fine dining. Oh. <laughs> um. Design constraints. You face. I don't yes. know. Like, so, what are the things that would we want to know when looking at designing a heat exchanger? Mm, I don't know why I want to say this, but maybe like the materials you would use when you like design a heat exchanger. Mm, so, materials of construction. Okay. I'll give you that. All right. All right, let's see who else can help her out. Uh, James. The hot and cold fluids. What about them? Which specific fluid you want to use, whether there's water or... Okay, water. so I'll say utility considerations. All right, Carl, what about you? What are your thoughts? What about the uh, like corrosiveness of the fluid that's gonna be going through the heat exchanger? You say corrosiveness? Yes, sir, like, it's cor like how corrosive the fluid that's going through it could be. Okay. So that kind of have to go in with like what type of materials you would need to construct it out of. Yeah, these are definitely linked. Okay. Uh, Claire, any thoughts? Um, maybe uh, some materials, utility, property, process. Um, my my same thought was the one that uh, Bria had. Um, not sure. Let's see. Still thinking about like the materials that we would have to use. Um, uh, um, I'm not sure, Dr. Lopez. You're not sure? Okay. Not sure. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we can consider. Um, we we'll have to talk about today. The flow characteristics, and the type of heat exchanger, and then you could also consider the duty, size, and if there's a phase change. An important consideration that happens a lot when it comes to heat exchangers and what we typically call heat loops is, is there a reaction going on at the same time? Right, you have a lot of jacketed reaction systems where you're either inputting heat to keep the reaction going if it's endothermic or you're, you know, basically removing heat to control the reaction to make sure it doesn't, you know, end up in a runaway. Right, so there's all these things that we can consider in terms of designing a heat exchanger and determining the necessary specifications. A big thing that we always consider is, you know, when it comes to duty and size, is both the efficiency and cost efficiency. And so for those of you that have already taken econ, when you were looking at costing and sizing heat exchangers, what is the property that you used to get your cost estimate? It would be the surface area. Right, so the surface area of a heat exchanger is important as it relates to both this efficiency and cost efficiency. And I'll actually probably should just say surface area.
is important as it directly relates. to the cost of the exchanger. And so a lot of times when we're looking at heat exchanger design, we specify a lot of these values such that we can determine, well, what's the size, what's the surface area necessary to perform and you know the desired duty that we would like in the process. And from that, you can determine, well, how much is that gonna cost? Now, there's a lot of different types of heat exchangers that we can talk about. I would argue one of the simplest types is known as a double pipe heat exchanger. We'll talk about those today. The more standard shell and tube, which I believe we'll also get to talk about today. Then some of your more specialty types, plate and frame. As well as regenerative heat exchanger. And so we're, we spend a lot of time talking about shell and tubes because they're the, the most common that you'll see in a process. Um, and on that note, I, I like to bring your attention to this document that's in the course module. It's a really good paper on essentially key design aspects associated with heat exchangers, specifically shell and tube heat exchangers. And so your, your synthesis assignment that's for you know, this week to next week is going to involve answering questions around this document. And it does a really good job explaining and presenting diagrams associated with one of the, you know, the many, many arrangements and, you know, designs surrounding a shell and tube heat exchanger, as well as, you know, the key, you know, kind of pieces that make up the heat exchanger, their purposes and how they all relate to heat transfer and heat transfer performance. So, you know, you're definitely going to be taking a really good look in this system, in this document, excuse me. And it, I think it does a really good job of explaining some of the finer details associated with shell and tube heat exchanger design in a ways that probably would, would be inefficient if, if I kind of spent a lot of time diving into it. So we're going to be focusing on, you know, the equations and the calculations associated with heat exchangers to a large degree, but definitely don't neglect that document and that assignment because it's going to be really valuable to provide it additional context to some of the work that we do in lecture. So with that in mind, I'd like us to take a little step back and look at initially some key principles associated with the analysis of heat exchangers. And the first thing I want us to consider is the influence of flow characteristics on heat exchanger performance. And so for this, we can look at double pipe heat exchangers which is simply pipe within a pipe. So for the purpose of this illustration, 
let's say I have a cold fluid and a hot fluid coming in. And the hot fluid is going to be on the outer pipe like this. And the cold fluid is going to be on the inside pipe. And so in this case, let's first consider a system where the cold fluid is going to come in on this side and the hot fluid is also going to enter in the same direction such that we can consider this co-current flow or fluid that are both flowing in the same direction. So if I were to plot the temperatures with respect to distance, what should I expect these temperature profiles to look at like? This is my hot temperature, this is my cold temperature. What do we expect those temperatures to look like? So Mitch, what are your thoughts? I think that it would, it'd be a smooth line, like, and they would swap at the meeting point. So they have, a, I would think the hot has a negative slope and the cold has a positive slope. Okay, I buy that. And meet at a point somewhere so you think it's gonna do this it's not a straight line it's a, a smooth curved line up for the cold and a smooth curved line down okay so i'm seeing this maybe this yes sir anybody agree i okay, guess no I I don't think that they would swap so much as they would meet up at a point and just stay there. Okay. Well, Mitch, I'd have to agree with Claire because see what happens here is, is in this case, the temperature switched and you just broke thermo. And if you should do anything, it don't break thermo. Okay, so in, in this case, what would really happen is you would see this asymptotic temperature approach, right? And so the hot temperature would leave like this, the cold temperature would leave like this, and we would have two, and, and we would see that the temperature gradient, right, given by this little black stuff that I'm squiggling, only there was a way to like paint in the middle things, but you know, alas. This is our temperature gradient. And you see it starts out with a large temperature gradient and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so my heat transfer rate is gonna fall as we move along this double pipe heat exchanger. And so what that means is I have some temperature gradient here, delta T, and then another temperature gradient here, delta T2 which means if I wanted to express well, what's my temperature gradient throughout the exchanger, I would have to rely on, once again, a log mean temperature gradient. Yeah. No, 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 no. Can you say that one more time, Dr. Lopez? Um, just that last sentence that you said. Yeah, and so, I see a, a large temperature gradient initially, delta T1 is THI minus TCI, but then I see a much smaller temperature gradient on the outside at the exit, denoted by the temperature of the hot stream out, the temperature of the cold stream out, right, or a delta T2. And so to fully express the temperature gradient throughout the exchanger, I would need to calculate a log mean temperature gradient or a delta T log mean, which is delta T1 minus delta T2 over LN, Hold on, this is, my pen's getting a little squiggly, which tells me I should slow down. It's delta T1 over delta T2. Yeah. 
right? And for those of you that are in design, this is also known as the minimum approach temperature. I know Adam likes to use a minimum approach temperature, I think of like five degrees C when doing process design, right? And so what that means is you, over time, your, your exchanger is gonna start to be really inefficient. And so for a given system, if you're trying to get to a certain temperature, rise or fall, depending on if one of these are process streams or if they're both process streams, it's going to require a significant um, amount of heat search exchange area. Now let's consider the counter argument where once again I have the same system or same situation. Old stuff goes here. Where my cold fluid's gonna go this way, but now my hot fluid is gonna apparently transport to another lecture. It's gonna go here. And this is what I consider counter current flow. as the fluids are flowing in the opposite directions. And so once again, I wanna look at that same graph, but now my cold is coming in on this side, my hot is coming in on this side. And so what do I expect to see? In this exchanger. All right, Jasmine, what do you think? Um, I think they're gonna reach a point where they, uh, they get close enough together just from opposite directions, kind of similar to the co-current flow. Um, so from kind of decrease from the right to the left, hot temperature and yeah, and then I guess the cold will come up with it. Yeah. Maybe closer, but um, I guess it depends on the situation. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think. Fine. No, no worries, no worries. But, but you might see something that's a little different and that's important in this system, right? We see a much more stable temperature gradient throughout the heat exchanger. It may not be as significant over here, right, with that initial gradient, but on average, we see the efficiency of the exchanger remaining fairly constant. And once again, I have a delta T1 here, a delta T2 here, and I can calculate my delta T log mean as I did in the previous one, where that is just going to be that delta T1 minus delta T2 over natural log of delta T1 over delta T2. But like I said, a much better efficiency and much better use of our exchanger in this counter current flow system as compared to this cross current flow system, right? Because I would argue probably about here, this is, this is gonna be inefficient. Inefficient heat transfer, I don't need to write it. It's already ugly as it is. But here we see a much more efficient heat exchanger. And so what I would say for a given <clears throat> desired duty, this is gonna have less require less surface area and the heat exchanger is going to be smaller than for a co-current system. And the last type of flow regime that we can typically consider is what's known as a cross-current flow. 
and it's a little different. And the best way I would describe cross current flow system for a double pipe is if the system kind of looked like this. where we would have a cold fluid like this, and then we would have a hot fluid that goes like this, right? So instead of running co or counter to the flow, it's running in a different you know, dimensional plane. So the cold fluid could be coming in here, the hot fluid probably be coming in here, and it would flow across the pipe. I have a question. Yes. Why is the cold always in the middle? It's not. That's just how I've drawn it for this example. Nobody seemed to complain, so. Oh. And so what we find in general is that the delta T log mean for a counter current system is going to be greater than the delta T log mean for a cross current system, which is going to be greater than the delta T log mean for a co-current flow regime. And, you know, with this in mind, I'd state that the surface area, or required surface area for a counter current system It's going to be less than the required surface area for a cross current flow system. And it's going to be less than the required surface area for a co current. All right, and so basically, in general, the counter current flow patterns are going to be more the most efficient when it comes to heat transfer and a good heat exchanger design. Well, though, to be honest, in general, for most heat exchangers, it's going to be very rare to have true countercurrent flow, which we'll get to in a minute. So, any questions on that? Nope. Okay. So with this in mind, let's consider these fluids again. All right, we have a hot stream and a cold stream exchanging heat or thermal energy, however you want to say it. I can describe the heat transfer rate out of the hot stream or Q sub H as the mass flow rate of the hot fluid times the heat capacity of the hot fluid times the temperature of the hot fluid in minus the temperature of the hot fluid out. And at the same time, I can quantify the heat transfer rate into the cold fluid as the mass flow rate of the cold fluid times the heat capacity of the cold fluid times the temperature of the cold fluid out minus the temperature of the cold fluid in. And asterisks, if a stream is boiling or condensing, I would say my heat transfer rate is equal to that mass flow rate of that stream that's boiling or condensing times lambda, where lambda is the heat of vaporization. And so for given process streams, utility streams, when looking at a heat transfer problem as it applies to heat exchanger, these are three equations that you should immediately consider.
These are all from thermodynamics associated with heat transfer rates into fluids and substances as a function of their capacity just to hold heat, a la heat capacity. Or if they're phase changing, the energy required to phase change. This should be coupled with what's known as the design equation for heat exchangers. All right, so the design equation that we consider for heat exchangers, Q, is equal to U times A sub S times F times delta T log mean. And just to make sure that you understand this is really important, I'll give you all of the fanfare that you'd like for this equation. And once again, as I stated, where delta T log mean is equal to delta T1 minus delta T2 over natural log of delta T1 over delta T2. All right, and in case you guys haven't figured out, this is also important. I've written it, I think, three or four times in this lecture alone. So the question then becomes, well, what the heck is U? You know what surface area is, and what the heck is F? So U is, oh, I don't want gray. is our overall heat transfer coefficient. Meaning for a heat exchanger, there are multiple heat transfer coefficients That must be calculated. So yes, you do a lot of work to find an H and you realize it's only one of two, maybe even three terms that you may need. So we can calculate you to be honest, one of many, many, severally different, confusing and complicated ways. I will give you a few that I think will be sufficient to make reasonable calculations. The first way is a consideration of a heat exchanger where U is one over HI times A sub I plus ln of do over di divided by two pi kl plus one over ho a sub o to the negative one. So what type of equation does this look like? Because you've seen terms that look like this before. It resembles resistance. It does resemble resistance, which means if we're honest, U is simply just one over, or it's just an R total of sorts. Now, if I'm really honest, 
it's really more related to one over R total. <clears throat> because it's just written in my notes. All right, and so what we have here is an inside convection resistance. We have an outside convection resistance. And we have a conduction resistance. And so if I'm looking at a heat exchanger and zooming in, what I'm really looking at is if this is a fluid, this is another fluid, right? I'm considering three things. I'm looking at HO, HI, as well as the R conduction on that pipe wall. And those three terms typically make up our overall heat transfer coefficient. So our overall heat transfer coefficient is essentially a calculation of the thermal resistances that we find within a given heat exchanger, as typically expressed as a function as the inside heat transfer coefficient or the heat transfer coefficient of the interior fluid. We typically call that tube side the outer heat transfer coefficient of the fluid around the uh, essentially confined interior fluid. We typically call that the shell side fluid. And then the conductive resistance of the pipe material separating the two fluids. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now, for most systems, the conduction resistance of that pipe is pretty small and can be considered negligible. Right, because if we consider those pipes 99 times out of 100 to be made of metal, high thermal conductivity, low thermal resistance. So as compared to the thermal resistances of your fluids, having that third term isn't gonna do a lot for you. And at the same time, if the pipe thickness is small, we can say II is approximately AL, right? So the surface area on the inside of the pipe isn't gonna be too different than the surface area on the outside of the pipe. We can simplify our overall heat transfer coefficient U as simply one over HI plus one over HO to the negative one. And this is our simplified overall heat transfer coefficient expression. And I'm sure this is the one that you probably use in design. <clears throat> yeah, we've never but, even seen the solution. Yeah, okay, well, uh, the unfortunate news is this isn't design. And so we can consider not only the conductive resistance of the pipe, but also an additional thermal re resistance can exist due to what is known as fouling. And all right, Jacob, you took membranes. So what is fouling? 
That was essentially when um, the, I guess the flow running through the membrane will essentially contaminate the membrane itself. And over time, as the flow keeps going through, it will decrease the efficiency and the effectiveness yeah. of the membrane. Yeah, so that was what it applies to membrane. In this case, fouling is simply just the accumulation of essentially solid slash gunk on the pipe surface. of our heat exchanger. And so if I, you know, kind of zoom in on this pipe, right? If I got cold fluid inside and I've got, I don't know, let's say I was doing something on the outside, but I get a lot of, you know, just kind of gunk or rust because I was a bad engineer and this material is kind of corrosive, right? So suddenly that material that's supposed to have a high thermal conductivity now has some sort of, you know, junk on the outside, All right? That's going to dramatically influence my heat exchanger's performance because now I have another thermal resistance that I have to consider in my system. And so, if I wish to consider a fouling in a heat exchanger, I can have another equation for you, which states U is equal to one over H I A sub I plus R F sub I A sub I plus L N of D over D I over two pi K L plus R F O divided by A sub O plus one over H O A sub O to the negative one. And so now I have my two heat transfer coefficients, one for the fluid on the inside, the fluid on the outside, the conductive resistance due to the pipe, as well as any fouling that exists on either the inside of my pipe, where fouling is being caused by the interior fluid, or the outside of the pipe, RFO, where the fouling is being caused by the fluid on the outside. And so, when looking at a heat exchanger and determining your heat transfer coefficient, it's important to ask yourself which of these terms can be neglected and make sure you have good justification for it. Now, if you're looking at a design system, assuming you, you, you design it well, a brand new exchanger isn't going to have fouling. And so you're not going to worry about that when you're looking at heat exchanger design. And at the same time, if you're designing a new exchanger, you assume that the metal you're using is of good quality, has, you know, the expected thermal conductivity, and so you're not going to worry about the conductive resistance of the material, which is why when you're looking at design considerations, nine times out of 10, you're just gonna use this one over HO over one over HI, because it's gonna work. But if you're looking at an, you know, an actual plant with a heat exchanger that's been in operation for quite a while, you know, six months or more, that's when you're gonna have to consider, okay, how is that heat exchanger gonna change over time and, you know, with wear and tear. And so, you know, another thing that we can consider is what changes do we expect as a heat exchanger experiences fouling. And so when I mean by changes, I mean changes in operation. And this will be important for those of you in design too next semester, but it's always good to think about these things ahead of time. I'm out of names. I'm gonna have to just pick people. <laughs> All right, Caroline, what do you think is going to happen to a heat exchanger as we start to see fouling? Well, I think it's going to deteriorate and not um, 
work as well, but I think the coefficient will increase probably. Do you think the U will increase? Well. Or the R will increase? The R. Okay, I agree. R will definitely increase. What do we think might happen to the duty? Or the Q? In a heat exchanger, if we see fouling. It should increase, right? Because it's going to have to work harder to perform the same function. Well, let's take a look at the equation. If my R values in my giant U equation increase, what's going to happen to my U value? Uh, I guess it'll go down. All right, so if my U value goes down, what's going to happen to my Q as governed by this design equation? And decrease, right? Yeah, my Q is going to decrease, right? And so the fouling is going to cause a decrease in heat transfer rate for my heat exchanger because my resistance goes up, my overall heat transfer coefficient falls, and if my heat transfer coefficient falls, right, my U goes down, so does my Q. And keep in mind, I don't think I actually explicitly said this, but this Q here is also has to be equal to QH and QC, right? It's, it has to be balanced if, or the energy balance breaks. And if you don't want to break thermo, you definitely don't want to break the energy balances. Which means these expected temperature gradients are probably also going to change. And so you're going to see your process falling off spec. Nobody wants that. So it's important to consider, you know, when you take, you know, look at it in the reverse, if you have a process that's been working fine, but suddenly maybe you're producing less steam as you thought you would, your temperature's changing. One of the things you can consider is, you know, is your heat exchanger suffering from fouling or wear and tear associated with having an increase in the thermal resistance. All right, so to wrap up, let's take a look at one example. So let's say a double pipe heat exchanger is being constructed of stainless steel with an inner tube diameter of 1.5 centimeters, an outer diameter of 3.2 centimeters. And if the can heat transfer coefficients in HI is 800 watts per meter squared Kelvin and HO is 1200 watts per meter squared Kelvin, for the given fouling values, determine the thermal resistance of the heat exchanger per unit length and the overall heat transfer coefficient. All right. So for this problem, we're looking for R total and U, where R total is simply just one over U. And so for this, I'm gonna say R total is equal to one over HI A sub I plus R FI over A sub I plus ln do divided by d sub i over two pi kl plus rfo for a sub o plus one over h o area sub o. And since it's the total, I don't put the negative one to find the total thermal resistance. Now, I'm looking for things per unit length. And for this one, I'm gonna take a basis since I don't have enough information, and since I'm looking at length of one meter squared area, to simplify my expression. And I'll also state that area I is approximately area O, such that I can neglect them in, in some of these calculations. 
And so with this in mind, I would rewrite my expression like this. And with this in mind, I just have to plug in terms and solve, or say our total is equal to one over HI, which was 800 watts per meter squared Kelvin, plus our F sub I, or the fouling on the inside, which was given as 0 0.0004 meter squared Kelvin per watt. plus the natural log of 3.2 divided by 1.5. They're both in centimeters, so I don't have to worry about units. Divided by 2 pi k, which is the thermal conductivity. I think I scaled, it was what, 15 watts per meter Kelvin. <clears throat> so length, we're looking at things per unit. So that would just be one meter. Our FO is going to be 0 0.0001 meter squared Kelvin per watt. And one over HO is simply one divided by 1200. watts per meter squared Kelvin. And so to make the units work out, because I see this is all meter squared Kelvin per watt, except for the middle, which is Kelvins per watt. But since I'm looking at a basis of one square meter, I could put those values in and say this is gonna be times a square meter, this is gonna be divided by a square meter, this is gonna be divided by a square meter, and this is gonna be times the square meter to make it look like the original expression. So with this in mind, I get an R total of approximately 0 0.0106 kelvins per watt, which means that my U value is gonna be one over R total which is gonna be 94 watts per Kelvin per meter squared, which was my basis. So that's how I can do that calculation. This one was just a simple write out, redefine it and solve. So any questions on how I was able to look at finding the overall heat transfer resistance and the overall heat transfer coefficient. Dr. Lopez, I have a question. Um, how is the uh, your units for R total, how is that K, uh, Kelvin um, per watt? And then for you, it's watts per Kelvin meter squared. Because of the basis that I took in the problem. Oh, okay. So putting that basis in where all the A's are gives me an R total in Kelvin per watt. And I, I always just put it back in U because U typically and traditionally has units of watts per meter squared Kelvin, just like heat transfer coefficients because it is a heat transfer coefficient. 
Okay, then. so meter squared isn't necessary in um, when, when you're writing it for uh, when you're writing out the units for our total. No, because our total. Remember, when we talk about our total, we say it's delta t over our total. So a lot of times it ends up just being kelvins per watt. So that when you do kelvins divided by kelvins per watt, you're left with watts. All right, because you look at the units here. This is kelvin. This is kelvin per watt, and this is watts. What kind of heat exchanger was that in that example? I think it was a double pipe heat exchanger. All right, any other questions? If not, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you all for your attention. I'll be on office hours in a little while, but if not, take care guys and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. All right, take care, have a good one.